Hebrews chapter 12, if you'll join me there today, the first two verses, just the first two verses, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. As always, I read this afternoon from the King James text. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and the Word of God today reads, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Let's run with patience the race that is set before us. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, Run to Daddy. Amen. You might see my illustration up there this afternoon. Run to Daddy. Amen. Praise God and amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as I begin this message today. Father, once again, God, we come before you and we humble ourselves in your presence. There is no greater responsibility that can be placed in the hands of mere mortal man than that responsibility of preaching and delivering a word from our God, our Creator, our Savior, our King to the people of God and to the sheep of His pasture. Oh, Master, today I know, God, you've laid a message on my heart. And Lord, I know that there is something good and positive that is to be gleaned from this message today. But without your help, I am helpless. Without the anointing of the Holy Ghost, there is nothing I can say that will be a blessing to, or a benefit to your people. Anoint today, O God, the speaker. Anoint today, O Lord, every hearer. Those that are listening now live, those that will later listen. By reason of the internet, open not only our ears, but open our hearts, our spirit. Cultivate the ground of our soul today, O God. That the seed of your word might find good ground upon which to root itself and to grow, that fruit might be brought forth unto righteousness for your name's sake. We ask all this today in none other than Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Paul said in, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that we need to run with patience. The race that is set before us. And yet in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, the Apostle Paul wrote the words, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Now I don't know about you, but my understanding of the process of walking and running and moving using our legs is a process that requires we first learn to walk. You can't run until you have first learned to walk. Can I tell the truth? Not very many people put a baby. Look at my illustration today. There's daddy with that beautiful little baby kind of running in his direction. Not very many people put a and then yell at that baby now run to daddy 
No, you'd be pretty foolish to do that. Because that baby hadn't even learned yet to walk. They haven't even gotten the skills yet that are necessary to maintain their balance and to understand the concept of putting one foot in front of the other. Am I telling the truth? No. Before that baby can run, it first has to learn to walk. The same thing is true of God's people today. Many believers cannot run because they haven't even yet learned how to walk walking by faith rather than by that which we see with our natural eye is a skill that requires time and effort it's counterintuitive to human beings we naturally tend to rely upon physical natural visible cues to draw conclusions as to which way we should go or how we should go about doing something. We're accustomed, Tommy, to making judgments, looking at the ground before us and determining how we're going to travel from there. I know sometimes I'm such a clutter bug, and Tommy, don't you say nothing. Nobody wants to hear from you back there. I'm such a clutter bug to get through my garage. I'd be nuts if I closed my eyes and even let Tommy try to lead me through. Because there's no way in the world he'd be able to lead me through my garage without me banging up my knees and tearing up my calves. Am I telling the truth? I am. Because I've got it set where there's just a little path that runs down through a part of it, you know, to help me get from the door from the house to the, to the outside. But the Word of God tells us that the just shall live by faith. The Word of God tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. My God, if we walk by faith, how in the world can God expect us to run? Because that means... We'd have to be running by faith as well, doesn't it? Amen. That means we'd have to be running without being able to see what's ahead of us. That means we'd have to be running. You see, God isn't looking for people who give Him half an effort. God isn't looking for people who half believe Him and half trust Him. God isn't looking for people who are playing games with this thing called faith. He's looking for people who can trust Him implicitly. So when He says run, you know you can run. Hallelujah. The way is clear before you. He wouldn't tell you to run if He hadn't already cleared the way. My God, the many believers today, they're not running the race that is set before them because many believers today are still sitting on the sidelines like infants who have not yet even learned how to walk. If you don't know how to walk by faith, honey, there's very little chance you're going to be able to run by faith. Hallelujah. Our primary instinct today is to remain safe and secure. How does one learn to walk blindly, allowing the Lord God to lead us when we are so accustomed to trusting and relying upon that which we see? And how can we possibly run in the dark? until we first learn to walk in it. Am I telling the truth today? Mm -hmm. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, the Word of God said, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Hallelujah. Whether you're walking or whether you're running, you ought to be walking or running hand in hand with Jesus. You ought to be running or walking hand in hand with the Lord. Knowing that he's going to guide you in good places, safe places, places that will benefit your soul and bring blessing to your life. In Psalm 23 verses 1 and 2, we often quote these words, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. 
pastures. He leadeth me, hallelujah, beside the still waters. He leadeth me. He leadeth me. Oh, well, there's an old Baptist hymn that says, He leadeth me, oh blessed thought. Oh, words with heavenly comfort wrought. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, it is God's hand. That leadeth me. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, honey. You can't run to daddy. The promise that we as people of God look forward to. As I've preached in recent weeks and months. Is the promise that one day. We're going to look at daddy. Hallelujah. And we're going to see him as he is. He doesn't want us walking through the pearly gates. He wants us running. Hallelujah to God. I talked about just last week how the word of God said to follow peace with all men and holiness. Mm -hmm. So there are two things we ought to be pursuing, peace and holiness. Mm -hmm. But the word of God tells us to follow these things. It doesn't tell us we're ever going to own them, but it says that we ought to run after them. Isn't that what I told you? Isn't that what I helped you understand? The original Greek term for follow literally means to pursue, to, to really run after. You see, we got a bunch of Christians in the world today. Oh my God, we're lucky if they'll get up off their lazy backside to walk toward something. God said, don't walk toward nothing. Run toward it. I'm going to tell you, I've learned that the only kind of faith that is real, the only kind of faith worth anything is stubborn faith. Tommy looks at me sometimes, and I'm sure a whole bunch of other people do too. And they think, man, that old preacher, he just out of his mind crazy. He had just flat nuts. He just got out of gallbladder surgery on Wednesday and look at him trying to get in the pulpit on Sunday. And I did it, didn't I? Yes, I did. And I was there the next Sunday. And I was there the next Sunday. They told me it's going to take me six months to recover from my gallbladder surgery. That's all right. The, the pulpit isn't going to be empty for no six months. I promise you that. Because this old preacher, I'm nuts. I'm crazy. I'm stubborn when it comes to my faith. I don't just walk after it. I run after it. Hallelujah to God. I don't trust God a little. I trust God a lot. Hallelujah. My God, we've got people in the church today disgust the crap out of me. I don't even know how else to say it. Oh, I tell you, I can't afford to go to church. I can't afford the gas to drive to church and go to church. Well, you know, yeah, because God knows if you exercise the little bit of faith, mister. If you exercise a little bit of faith, lady, God knows that he wouldn't meet your need. God knows that the word of God said, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. But why don't you just keep living in unbelief? Why don't you just keep sitting on the sideline and never learn to walk? Never mind learn to run. Oh my God. Don't even look at me like I'm not telling the truth today because I know I am. This church in Dallas is empty because there's a whole truckload of faithless people in this city. And I'm going to say it, and if you're offended by it, there's a good probability you're offended because it applies to you. My whole life, I've known the Lord. I've been walking in relationship with King Jesus since I was a kid. When I was 16 years old, I never had a thought in the universe. A thought never went through my mind when I was a teenager. Never even went through my mind to leave home 
Never even went through my mind to move somewhere or to live away from home with my mom and my dad. But then God spoke to me when I was 16 years old and said, I want you to go to Texas. I said, what? I'm a New England boy. I'm a Connecticut uh, you know, native. I, I grew up in Connecticut. Why in the name of the Lord am I going to go to Texas? And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to go to Texas because that's where I'm going to train you for your ministry. I said, Lord, could you just train me here? Couldn't you just train me while I'm comfortable? Can't you just train me where I don't have bills to pay and, and where I don't have rent and I don't have a whole lot of responsibility? And the Lord spoke to me and said, if you're going to preach faith, you need to learn how to live by faith and how to walk by faith. And you need some lessons in faith if ever you're going to be able to lead people in this way called faith. I went to my mother, asked her. I went to my mother. I said, Mother, God called me to Texas. The Lord told me to go to Texas. I'm going. I was 16 years old. I dare say at 16 years old I had more faith in my pinky than most people have today in their entire body. Was I scared? Sure I was. I didn't know anything about Texas. Didn't know first thing in the world about Texas. Never had been here. Hadn't even visited. Had a great aunt live down here. Only thing I knew about her was she was a disciplinarian and a bulldog. Every time, every summer, she'd come up and spend a month or two in the Northeast because she hated the Texas heat. She had lived here for decades, and she still couldn't stand the Texas heat. She had to go up home where it was cooler during the summer months. She'd come up every summer, and all oh, she loved to bark at the kids, and she was a disciplinarian, I mean to tell you. She, she was not known to be the friendliest or the kindest or the sweetest woman on the planet. But I always liked her. I always looked up to her. She was Pentecostal. She'd come to our church and she'd get to shouting and Mama would get this hot Toyota in all over the place. <laughs> we used to tease her when she'd get to talking in tongues. There was a phrase she'd say once in a while, Hot Toyota! So we'd tease her about Hot Toyota in. She'd shout and dance and have church. And I used to love when she'd come up and be in our church services because she brought a little bit of fire and a little bit of pep with her, you know. But that's the only person I knew in Texas. My cousin, her daughter, was still living at home. She had graduated from high school a couple of years earlier. I still had two years of high school to complete. Called my great aunt. I said... God has called me to Texas. Can I come down and stay with you for a while? I said, I'll actually try to find my own place because I'm not trying to be a burden on anybody. I said, but until I can get situated, can I stay with you? She said, sure, come on down. Was I nervous? Was I trepidatious? Was I afraid? You know I was. If there was anything I was afraid of at that time, it was flying. I had never flown in an airplane in my life, and I was terrified of flying. But you know what I did? I went and bought me an airline ticket to fly to DFW Airport from Bradley International Airport in Hartford, Connecticut. I'm going to fly. I'm terrified of flying, but I'm going to fly to Texas. Why? Because God called me to Texas. And one thing I know about God, God ain't going to call you somewhere so you can die en route. True. I'm going to tell you, I came to Texas. I want to be in here for a good while. I eventually got myself, after several months, I wound up getting myself my own little apartment. I was going to school from 8 in the morning till about noon. I was in the distributive education program, so I got credit for working a job. I then went to work from 3 in the afternoon till 11 o'clock at night.
I told my boss I wanted Sunday and Wednesday off because I went to church and I'm going to go to church by God. And guess what? He gave me Sunday and Wednesday off. I didn't miss a church service. I promise you I never missed a single church service. I don't care how I felt. I don't care if I was feeling sick, feeling bad, feeling depressed, feeling whatever. Honey, I knew enough to know that there ain't a better place in the universe to be than in the house of God. When you're sick, they ain't nowhere better to be than in the house of God. When you're depressed, there's nowhere better to be than in the house of God. When you're struggling, there is nowhere better to be than in the house of God. When you're in a bad mood, there is nowhere better to be than in the house of God. When you're struggling with your faith, there is nowhere better to be than in the house of God. I came down. I had my own apartment. I went to school, I went to work, I went to church. I had so many experiences, good and bad, that I couldn't begin to go through them all right now. But I'm going to tell you, I had some experiences during that time I'd have never had if I were still living at home with mom and dad. I owed rent, and I didn't quite have enough money because... Uh, the way it worked at work, I worked for a convenience store, and the way it worked, every time I ate something or drank something, I'd have to write it into a little book, and then when I got paid, I'd have to pay what I owed. Well, sometimes I was just a kid, and I was not the greatest with money when I was young, by any means. I'd spent a little more than I should have eating and drinking at work, you know, and I'd wind up a little bit low on my rent or whatever, and I'd say, oh, Lord, am I in trouble now? Lord, I need, I think one time, if I remember the number correctly, I think I needed $63. So I need $63, and Jesus, I don't have it. I was renting a room from a lady in a little boarding house type situation. And... Uh, I said, Lord, I need $63, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Long story short, I, I won't go through the whole story, but I went to church, and a lady in the church felt the Holy Ghost when I shook her hand, and after church, she came to me, handed me an envelope, said, the Lord told me to give this to you. I went home, opened the envelope. It was $63 on the nose. See, you can't learn to run. Woo, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You can't learn to run until you learn to walk. And God was He was teaching me to walk mm -hmm. by faith and not by sight. Mm -hmm. Well, why did the Lord give you $63 instead of 70 or instead of 65 or instead of 85 I'll tell you why. Because, honey, when God meets your need penny for penny, that helps you to know it's God. What are the chances of that being happenstance? What are the chances that that was just coincidence? Right. Mm -hmm. I went to Texas. I... Had to go up home for a brief while. My mother wanted me to go up home for a little while. I went up, and long story short, I did some painting to make the money to get back to Texas because I knew that's where God wanted me to be. And I only had a pair of cowboy boots that I'd been wearing. I didn't have, nowadays I got so many shoes I don't know what to do with them. Back then I only had one pair of shoes, these cowboy boots. And I had to paint in them. And I got paint all over them, and I, I didn't know how to clean off the paint and get it all off, so I wound up coming back to Texas in them old cowboy boots, and I wore them to church. And I remember praying, I said, Lord, I'd sure love for you to give me a new pair of boots for church so I don't have to wear these old painted up boots in church all the time. And then I thought about it for a minute. I said, Lord, if it's not asking too much, could you give me a pair of shoes and a pair of boots? I don't want to wear cowboy boots all the time. Maybe I should wear shoes to church and boots to work. But I said, if you could just help me get one pair of boots and one pair. And you talk about living hand to mouth, honey. I didn't have money to buy nothing. I didn't have money to buy nothing. 
literally, what all I ate is what I ate at school. I used to get free lunches at school. One of my teachers, bless her heart, had such compassion on me that she made arrangements with the school for me to get free breakfast. If I got to the school early enough in the morning, I'd get a little free breakfast and then I'd have my free lunch in the afternoon before I left. And then I'd go to work and I'd wind up eating one of them heating them up hamburgers, you know, at work. That'd be my dinner. That's what I ate. That, that was my whole diet for the most part. And I prayed. I said, Lord, I don't have the money to buy new shoes. I don't have money to buy new boots, but I'd like a new pair of shoes. And not new, but just new to me, you know, pair of boots and pair of boot shoes. One day, Brother Freeman said, Saul, I said, I speak his name to honor his memory. He was an older man at the church who took to me, pulled me under his wing like I was his own kid. So, oh, I, my memories of him are so sweet, I can't even tell you. I thank God for that man every day. And one Sunday, Brother Sensball come to me. Wish you could have heard his testimony. He spent over 13 years in prison for murder. Yep, murder. Before he came to the Lord. A brother Sensball came to me one Sunday. He said, Chuck, he said, after church, I want you to come out to my car. I've got something for you. I said, okay, brother Sensball. So after church, he took me out to his car. He said, you know me, I like to go thrift shopping. I love my thrift shops. And he had asked me at some point what size shoe I wore. And I told him, you know, a ten and a half. And he said, I found these at the thrift shop and I felt led to buy them for you. And he pulled out two bags. And in each bag, listen to me, in each bag there were two, there was one pair of boots in one bag and a pair of shoes. And in the other bag, there was another pair of boots and another pair of shoes. Well, I went home that day. I was practically dancing down the street. I said, thank you, Jesus. You heard my prayer. Thank you, Lord. You doubled my prayer. I asked for one pair of boots and one pair of shoes, and you gave me two of each. I wore my new shoes to church, and... Sister Alexander, bless her little heart. She was a little lady in our church, didn't have a lot of money, wasn't very well to do. She saw my new shoes, she came over. Oh, Brother Chuck, I'm so glad to see you with a new pair of shoes. She said, oh, God answered my prayer. And I said, he did. He answered your prayer. She said, yes. She said, honey, I saw you coming to church with them old painted up boots. She said, and I asked the Lord to give you a new pair of boots. She said, but then I thought about it for a minute. And I said, well, Lord, he may not want to always wear boots. Maybe he'd like a pair of shoes too. So I asked him to give you a pair of shoes and a pair of boots. <laughs> I said, Sister Alexander, I prayed the same identical prayer, and I'm here to tell you, God answered both our prayers. He gave me two pair of boots and two pair of shoes, and we both shouted about it for a while. Tell me God ain't real. Tell me this is all circumstance. God had to call me to Texas so I could learn faith. So I could learn what it was to have to lean on Him and have to walk by faith and not by sight. He knew the day was going to come when He was going to say, Run to Daddy! Hallelujah! Alright, stop walking and start running! And I couldn't possibly run to Him if I hadn't already developed the trust necessary to walk. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. Learning to walk is a matter of trust. Do we trust the Lord enough to lead us in a manner that will keep us safe and secure? A blind individual must put their trust in one who guides them. 
They'll place their right hand on the forearm of their guide and carefully follow that guide's leading. Now, if they think for a minute the guide is going to lead them into traffic or is going to lead them into furniture, other people, or dangers in their path, then you better know they're not likely to follow that guide. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Many believers would rather tap their way through life with a white cane rather than place their hand on the Lord and allow Him to lead us. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Did you hear what I said? Too many believers, they want to use a cane and tap their way through because they still want to trust themselves more than they want to trust the Lord leading and guiding them. But we've got to learn to trust. A baby learns to trust its parents early in life. Much of the trust a child has in their parents is built upon experiences the child has long before they can even remember. Well, the kid gets to be a certain age and he says, All I know is at lunchtime, mom's putting food on the table, grandma's putting food on the table. So therefore, they get to the point where they trust that mom or grandma are going to take care of them and make sure they're fed, make sure they're taken care of. It's natural to their thinking that mom or dad or grandma and grandpa are going to feed them and help them to get their clothes on. It just comes naturally because that's all they've ever experienced. They've never known what it is to live out in the weather because mom, dad, somebody's always provided a home for them. When we look back on our lives, even before we knew the Lord, sometimes we begin to realize that God was already present and providing for us. Yes. Even while we were yet unbelievers. Yes. And we learned the very first lessons in trust. The Bible said it's the goodness of God that leadeth men unto repentance. I'm going to tell you, God wants you to be able to look back on your journey. And remember that while you were still a sinner, while you were still an unbeliever, while you were still living like a dog and clubbing it up and drugging it up and drinking it up, how many times when you look back can you see the hand of God preserving your life and keeping you from peril and keeping you from destruction? How many times when you look back do you realize, my goodness, God was there and I didn't even realize it? But see, those memories are just the beginning of helping us to trust Him moving forward. That's just the beginning. Help us trust Him moving forward. I want to tell you, a lot of kids, they learn not to trust mom and dad. They, they begin to question their trust in mom or dad when they get to an age where they're out at the pool and daddy says, Come on, honey, jump into daddy's arms. Because the kid's afraid to get in the water. So daddy stands there and says, Jump in my arms, I'm going to catch you. It's all right, it's all good. And she finally gets up the nerve. And she gets down on her hunches. And she gives herself a good push up in the air. Expecting daddy to catch her. And then he goes, ha ha, and pulls his arms away. And she falls into the water, scared out of her mind. She's going to drown. How many of us have been there? How many of us, after that, never quite trusted mom or dad the way we did beforehand? Am I telling the truth? You see, one of the things you need to trust somebody is consistency. Yes. You can't afford people to be playing. I want to tell you a little secret, honey. God don't play games with nobody. If the Lord tells you to jump and says, I'll catch you, you believe me, he's going to catch you. He doesn't pull his arms away and say, ha ha, the joke's on you. <laughs> if he wants you to jump in the water and he wants you to learn to jump in the water and to trust him, he'll say to you, jump in, sweetie, because I am not about to let anything bad happen to you. But he's not going to tell you, jump into my arms and then pull his arms away. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? Later in our life, we may hear Daddy say, jump into the pool and I'll catch you. 
And we do so. Not because we've ever done that specific thing before, but because we've learned that Daddy is trustworthy. He does what He says He will do. He always has in the past, so why in the world should I doubt Him now? So it is for believers. At some point, the Lord's going to ask you to do something you may not have ever done before. You have no experience in the matter. So you're not familiar with exactly how it's going to work. But when the Master says to jump, we know He is faithful and trustworthy. So we can confidently jump. The more we begin to step out in faith, the more our faith and confidence begins to grow. If we continue to exercise our faith and step out when the Lord calls us into new territory or into a new experience, we eventually come to the place where our confidence in God is unshakable and unmovable. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. I think that's why I'm such a stubborn old goat. When it comes to my confidence in God. Honey, I've had enough experience with the Lord to know, hallelujah, that He is worthy to be trusted. Glory to God. Oh my goodness. There is nothing today that my God can ask me to do that I will not confidently and unquestionably do. As our faith and confidence, also known today as trust, grows. We will eventually come to the place where we can run rather than simply walk. If the Lord says the road ahead is clear, so run, honey, we'll run. Glory to God. If an obstacle or an obstruction appears ahead, we know that the Lord will not let us get injured. He'll either alert us to its presence, or he'll move it out of the way before we get there. Glory to God. Faith is an issue of trust. When we trust that the Lord is only going to lead us to places of blessing, advantage, and improvement, we can easily walk, or better yet, run in our faith. Hallelujah. In Romans 8, 28, the promise of God's Word is, and we know, Paul said, and we know. He didn't say we believe. He didn't say we trust. He said we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to, listen, according to His purpose. The reason a lot of people don't trust God is because they're not trying to live their life according to His purpose. They've got a purpose of their own. They've got a plan of their own. They've got ideas of their own for themselves. And God's plans don't always mesh with my plans. And I'd rather go with my plans. See, I could trust God and I could walk by faith better yet. I could run by faith if I trusted God was going to lead me, listen to me now, where I want to go. <laughs> Only problem is, <laughs> God don't always lead us where we want to go. Sister Julie Maston, who I love to death, used to say, don't ever tell the Lord where you will not go. She said, because I promise you, that will be the first place He'll ask you to go. That the Lord loves to challenge us. He loves to challenge our faith. Don't tell Him, I won't go there, Lord. Because, honey, the minute you do, guess what? That's where you're headed. The problem for many Christians in their, ability, in their inability to walk in God's purpose for our lives rather than our own purpose. That's the problem many Christians have. Paul said, we know that all things work together for good to them who are the called and the most important forward phrase you ever read in your life according to his purpose Amen. 
His purpose may be to help us grow. His purpose may be to help us change. His purpose may be to help us mature or develop new skills. As a student in school, I used to resent any subject that I did not enjoy. <laughs> Most of us did. If we didn't enjoy the subject, then we resented it. At least I did. My classic response, like so many others, to certain subjects, in my case, algebra was the main subject. My classic response was, how is this going to help me in life? How many of us belted out that brilliant statement to our teachers? How many times have we said to our teachers, how is this going to help me in my life? You know why we'd say that? Because we thought we understood. Listen to me, children. We thought we understood the purpose of school. Many of our parents wrongly told us that the purpose of school was to help us learn things that will later help us in life. How many of you parents listening to me now? You told your kids when you sent them to school, honey, you're learning things that I help you later in life. See, you're telling them the wrong thing because you're giving them an idea of what the purpose of school is and that's not really altogether the, the proper purpose, the right purpose. And then when they try to match up that purpose that you've given them with what they're doing, they don't see a connection. It doesn't make sense to them. So therefore, they're saying, well, why should I even have to do this? It didn't have nothing to do with daily life. It didn't going to help me in my life. <laughs> well, listen to me today. I thought I understood what school was all about. My parents had told me, hey, it's going to help you with... Things uh, You're going to learn things that will help you later in life. But the real purpose of certain subjects has nothing to do directly with helping us to learn skills which will later serve us in life. But rather, listen to me, they help us to think critically or to think logically or to reason out a problem. So the real purpose in that particular subject had nothing to do with helping me later in life directly. But in an indirect way it did because it was about helping me to learn how to reason, how to look at things, and how to logically follow a certain formula to reach my end game, my end goal. When we don't... When we don't understand and we don't know the true purpose in an experience, we'll often push against it. But when we trust God and know that what He is doing is something that's going to benefit us in our walk, it is something that we then can approach with confidence trusting Him for a good outcome. Hallelujah. Mark 10, 24, and the word, the word of God tells us that many trust in their wealth and the disciples were astonished at His words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. we got to learn to trust God, folks. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Many people today, rather than trusting God, will trust only themselves. In Luke 18, verse 9, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous 
and despised others. Second Corinthians chapter 1 verse 9, But we have the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. Salvation is a matter of faith. It's a matter of trust. At the hour of our death, we trust that God is able and committed to raise us up from the dead according to His promise. How can we trust the Lord for the biggest things when we haven't even yet learned to trust Him in the little daily matters of life? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. Psalm chapter 9 and verse 10, And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them, that seek thee. Psalm 16 and verse 1, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. Psalm 18 verse 2, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Psalm 18 verse 30, As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in Him. Psalm 20 verse 7, Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 22 verse 4. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. You know, there's a reason why we share testimonies in church. There's a reason why God told the nation of Israel that they were to repeat in the hearing of their children over and over and over again about the miracles He performed in order to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Because in hearing these tales of what God did for our fathers, we are encouraged to believe Him for ourselves. And I tell the truth. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a stubborn old thing when it comes to faith. My grandfather on my mother's side had a lot of warts. He had a lot of issues in his life. Bless his heart. But I'll tell you one thing. He is as, as imperfect a man as he was. He loved the Lord and he believed God. He had a lot of faith. I used to sit at my grandfather's knee growing up and I heard stories of God touching him and healing him and delivering him so many times that now I'm 56 years old. My grandfather's been dead for decades and I can tell you those stories word for word the way Grandpa used to tell them to me. I used to hear them so many times. Sometimes I look at Grandma and she'd have that look on her face like, I'm sorry, honey. And I have that look on my face like, it's all right. It's good. It's all good. You know what? I'm grateful now. I'm grateful now that Grandpa told me those stories over and over and over and over and over again. There are people, <clears throat> I won't say any names, Tommy. I'll just look their way and whistle. <laughs> There are people who have heard testimonies of what God's done for me and how the Lord has provided and how God has performed miracles in my life. And they've heard those stories so many times they're tired of hearing them. But you know what? I never get tired of hearing those old stories. I never get tired of hearing them. Because the more I hear them, the more they get drummed into my spirit. The more they get drummed into my soul. And like David, the writer of the Psalms, I'm able to say, Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. That helps me to trust him. Because I know what God did for Grandpa. 
I know what God did for Grandma. I know what God did for Brother Obar. I know what God did for Brother King. I know what God did for Sister Shields. I know what God did for Brother Doe. I know what God did for Brother Babcock. I know what the Lord did for Sister uh, Smeltzer. I heard their stories, what God did for them. Oh, hallelujah. I know that I can trust Him. Many people have trusted Him before me, and He's proven trustworthy. Hallelujah. Lastly, today, Jeremiah 39, 17 and 18. But I will deliver thee in that day, saith the Lord, and, and thou shalt not be given into the hand of the men of whom thou art afraid. For I will surely deliver thee, and thou shalt not fall by the sword, but thy life shall be for a prey unto thee, because thou hast put thy trust in me, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Run to daddy. Honey, God ain't looking for nobody walking to heaven. He wants people that are running in. Hallelujah. I don't know about you. I'm so excited about getting there. Glory to God. I'm so, I'm so thrilled at the notion of seeing God's great city. I'm so grateful for the idea that one day I'm going to live in a city whose builder and maker is God. It wasn't made by earthly hands. Oh my God, I'm so excited about that notion. I'm so excited. I'm going to see Daddy as He is. Oh, glory to God. I'm going to be changed. I'm going to be transformed so that I'll be able to look upon Him as God. I'm not trying to just wander on in like so many believers in the church today. If you can get them off the sofa long enough to move at all. God has called us to walk by faith. But He's also called us to run the race that's been set before us. You can't run till you first learn to walk. Amen. So I'm trying to tell you today, folks, it's time to start believing God. It's time to start stepping out in faith and letting God prove Himself. You can't learn to run until you first learn to walk. And Daddy is saying, run to Daddy. Hallelujah. Would you stand up?